Hello, I'm Dan Robinson with FPTV, and today on the interview we have Russell Sharman, uh, screenwriter and filmmaker. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks very much. You bet. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. So, so tell us first and foremost about uh, what it is to be a professional screenwriter. Well, I'm sure a lot of different people could answer that question uh, differently. Um, screenwriting is, is, I think, one of the aspects of the Hollywood industry that is sort of almost the most freelance. Um, actors can sort of work whenever there's projects being produced. Writers tend to work in isolation, hoping that their work gets bought and then eventually developed and then eventually made. Um, so it can be very solitary experience. Um, obviously, I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas now. I, I've lived in a lot of places, but um, so it is the kind of profession that you can do from sort of anywhere. Um, uh, I think it helps to live in Los Angeles, at least when you're starting out. But then once you've made some inroads, you know, you can, you can pretty much write anywhere. Uh, so it's the, it's the same as any other writer's life in the sense if you get up, you, you work on an idea and, and um, you try and push it through to completion and then make it better. Um, but of course, there's the business side where you have uh, representation agents and managers who are always trying to get you out there and get work. Um, in my experience, I would say only about half of my work is coming up with original ideas and writing them. I'm, I'm spending the other half of my time fielding ideas from producers and trying to develop those with them. And then maybe they go somewhere, maybe they don't. Um, writing up outlines and documents and treatments, trying to sell ideas. Um, so uh, there's a quite a bit of marketing involved, really, in, in sort of doing this for a living. Um, it's not all just coming up with stories. Um, though that part's the fun part, and you hope to sort of get to that part. Um, you know, uh, it can be, like I say, uh, somewhat of a, of a slog sometimes in that regard. Um, but it's hugely fulfilling when uh, you actually connect with something and something moves forward. So it's kind of worth the effort, I think. So as I think as people start off wanting to be screenwriters, so the first thing is like, I've got an idea, Russell, and mm -hmm. I, wanna, I wanna make a screenplay. So what's yeah. the first thing that I do? Well, uh, the first thing you should do is learn how a screenplay works uh, because a great idea can be lots of things. It could be a novel, it could be a short story, it could be a short film, it could be a play. Um, screenplays are a very sort of particular thing, a uh, particular animal that, that has its own sort of structure and, and way they operate. And lots of times I talk about how scripts are really three things. They're a literary genre, there's a, it's a form of creative writing, but they're also a technical document. Um, that is to say, it's sort of a blueprint for a finished film that's gonna require lots of collaborators, um, which means the third thing is it's a sales document. It's, it's trying to attract collaborators. So you kind of have to have all three of those in mind. Um, usually what I'll say is, you should go read uh, a book about screenwriting. And there are many out there. Uh, Sid Field and Robert McKee are two of the sort of most time-honored authors about structure. Read those books and then forget everything they say and, and sort of come up with your own approach. But they're great for giving you a sense of, again, how a, a screenplay sort of works as a piece of writing. Um, and then test your idea. Does it support uh, a film? Treatment uh, does it will it will it hold our interest for an hour and a half? Can you see how the contours of the plot might lay out over a three-act structure? And if so, start outlining, start laying out the beats of the story. Um, and if you're still satisfied that it works, then you can sort of dive into the script and start crafting those scenes. Um, but it usually requires a lot of careful planning. I I think there are some who write screenplays just fade in and start writing without really a plan, and, and sometimes that works for people. Nine times out of 10, it requires careful planning because again, it is such a specific genre of writing with a very specific structure that requires some thoughtfulness in terms of how it lays out. So you really do have to kind of get your ideas out before you begin applying the structure, before you begin applying them to the structure? I think so. Yes. Uh, again, everyone's gonna be a bit different. I sure. know people write novels that way as well, so it's not just screenwriting. Um, but because screenplays, again, are, are not necessarily meant to be read, uh, as a piece of literature, they're meant to be made into films. Um, there are conventions that are necessary to follow in order for it to be a successful exercise in screenwriting. Now, there are exceptions to this. If, if you're a filmmaker and you're writing something that you know you want to make, um, probably not for a lot of money, and, and so you can kind of keep that in mind as you're writing, you may not need to think through these things in the same way. Um, but typically, those who sit down to write a screenplay for the first time, it's sort of like you need to learn the rules before you can break them. Um, I think that's really the best way to approach it um, in terms of the fundamentals. Uh, now, 
once you do that, actually having a career in screenwriting, that's a whole other can of worms and, and a lot more difficult to sort of give you a, a pat answer. But. So then, as a segue there, um, yeah. so I have my screenplay. I've read the uh -huh. books, I've got it, I've sure. got it in my hands, now what do I do with it? Okay, uh, I walked right into that one. So um, it's, a, it's a tough business to break into, and that's true at any level. Um, but I think partly um, the reason it's tough is we have a very specific idea of what it means to work in Hollywood or or to work in the movie business. And it tends to be a very narrow definition of you know, getting a, a movie made by a big Hollywood studio that you've heard of, like Warner Brothers or Disney, and, and um, being released in theaters all over the country, that kind of thing. That level uh, of screenwriting is very difficult, nearly impossible, uh, to just waltz right into. But the way the media landscape has changed, I think, over the last even uh, 10 years, has meant that it's much more accessible. It's a lot easier to get things made, um, even at a very high level of professionalism, without necessarily having to go through the studio. So it really depends on what kind of career you want in the entertainment business as a writer. Um, obviously, television is a whole other area that uh, has opened up a lot of opportunities for writers at the same time as the film industry has contracted somewhat, at least at the studio level. Um, but to answer your question, there are things you can do once you have a screenplay that you feel confident about. Um, the first is uh, there are contests that you can submit to. Um, that's the easiest in the sense of you don't need any gatekeepers to submit your script to contests. The problem is there are thousands of contests. Most of them require an entry fee, and most of them are just taking your money. Right. And they're not necessarily going to do anything for you. Um, the Nichols Fellowship is probably the most uh, well-known. It's through the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Oscars. And uh, they actually do um, break open the door for writers. If you are a finalist in the Nichols Fellowship, then agents are reading your work and uh, you're going to get noticed. So that's one legit contest. There's another new uh, service uh, in the last maybe four years called The Blacklist. Now, The Blacklist uh, was started by a producer named Franklin Leonard um, many years before that, and it was really just a list of the, the best unproduced screenplays in Hollywood. It was sort of based on surveying producers and executives around town. But he segued that into a website where you can upload your scripts, and they, you can pay to have comments on your scripts. Uh, more on that in a moment. Um, but also, they're read by strangers. Anyone who goes on there can read any of the scripts, and they'll rate those scripts. And it's sort of a in a way, a kind of crowdsourcing um, interest in your screenplay. And it turns out uh, it has become a kind of go-to resource for a lot of uh, important players in Hollywood. Producers, executives, agents do read the higher rated scripts on the blacklist. Um, so that is a legit way, if your work is good, to sort of rise to the top and get noticed. Uh, I mentioned you know, paying a fee for someone to give comments on your script. This is another area that I think a lot of people get taken advantage of. Um, there are a lot of websites out there that say, pay me $500 and I'll give you detailed feedback uh, on your script. Um, that can be helpful. And if you've got that kind of money, God bless you, spend it in that way if you'd like to. Um, but uh, it, it's not necessarily going to help you get that meeting with an agent or get in front of a producer. Um, just be wary. Um, if you think it's a good fit and they're being helpful, great. But um, there's a lot of folks out there who'd like to make money off people who'd like to work in Hollywood. Um, and, you know, it's... It's an old story. Uh, it's a very desirable profession, so um, I think people are out there can sometimes take advantage. So just be careful. Sure. So, um, so then I've submitted to some contests, but then also kind of how, what, how would you recommend? You mentioned the script being a sales document. Mm -hmm. um, so who are you selling the script to? Well, okay. So if you again, if you want a career in in Hollywood, if you want to. Uh, be in a position where studios and or these sort of mid-tier financiers who are making the now 15 to 30 million dollar movies coming to you and asking about your, you know, what do you got and can we produce your scripts, that kind of, of career, um, you know, then you're going to want to think about the market for those kinds of movies. What, what movies are selling and there are lots of uh, websites out there that sort of track the different um, what we call spec scripts. These are scripts that are written um, without anyone asking for them and, and just hoping they sell. Uh, what's the market for that and, and what's selling well or just what movies are getting made? Um, so for example, uh, sword and sandal epics like Ben-Hur don't tend to do well and especially since Ben-Hur just bombed. Uh, right. Don't write a, a movie set in ancient Rome uh, with <laughs> the gladiators. You know, it's, it's not going to go well. Um, so you need to think about that in terms of how you position yourself because if you do happen to get 
uh, some success in that arena, whatever you land success with, sort of like whoever you take to the dance, you're going to leave with. <laughs> so if you enter that market uh, with a comedy, you're going to be a comedy writer. Um, if you enter it with a big sword and sandals epic and it works, then that's what you're going to do. It's very difficult, kind of like with actors, you kind of get typecast. So. Uh, in that sense, you want to think about how you want to market yourself as a writer. What are the kinds of things that you want to write? And finding that balance between what you enjoy writing and seeing uh, in film um, and having a career and wanting to sort of read the market can be tricky um, because sometimes you feel like you're kind of pandering and you don't want to do that because it will show in the quality. On the other hand, um, I think if you, one of the best ways to break into the business is to make things, uh, to not just wait around for permission for someone to say, I will, I will invest in your script and make your movie. Um, because of the way media has become so accessible in places like this at Faithful Access Television, um, and the, the expense of, of technology now is, has come down so far that you can make a, a movie that looks beautiful, could be in theaters uh, for very little money. And there are some great examples out there of that. Um, I immediately think of movies like Blue Ruin. I don't know if you caught that a couple years ago. Um, made it for very little money and uh, with some friends that had been making movies for a while, just sort of no budget movies. And now Jeremy Saulnier is the director and writer. He's just made The Green Room with Patrick Stewart. And he now has a career in Hollywood. Um, my path into the business was uh, a friend of mine had made an indie comedy for almost no money. Um, but it won a lot of awards, got into a lot of festivals. He got an agent and a manager. And then when I came along with the script and said, hey, you want to work on this with me? Uh, he said, yes, please. Um, and suddenly, I had an agent and a manager because of him. Um, so it can sort of work that way if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and not wait for permission and just go out there and make it. So there's really two paths, I think, that you can take. Uh, and honestly, being a self-starter and Therefore, thinking about what you write in terms of what you could actually make yourself could end up giving you that career that you really think you want. Um, you might also find along the way, you know what? I actually prefer making these smaller movies myself, um, and you don't need that big Hollywood career. Um, someone who comes to mind in that regard is someone like Jeff Nichols, who's an Arkansas filmmaker. He doesn't live here now, but he, he grew up here. Uh, and he started out making very low budget films in Arkansas. Uh, and they got noticed, and everyone, every film has gotten a little more high production value. Um, his latest is about to come out this fall. is called Loving. Um, it's about the first uh, interracial marriage, uh, when that was the Supreme Court decision about that. Um, and he sort of has built a career on, I don't care what Hollywood wants. I'm going to make the kind of movies that, that I want to make. And you know, in some ways, it, the proof is in the pudding. And his films have done so well that people keep giving him money to make the kinds of movies that he wants to make. So that kind of career is also possible. That's amazing. So just to kind of insert the information of, so here at FPTV, we do offer equipment mm -hmm. uh, where you can shoot a pilot or a trailer or you know a proof of concept is what we encourage people who have big ideas to try to shoot something small to get the idea and the feel across. Mm -hmm. So here at FPTV, we have classes in how to produce that, and then we have equipment to allow you to produce it at no charge to get your idea started. Um, yeah, so, I think that's fantastic. And then we also have a show called The Pilot Show where mm -hmm. people are allowed to submit, if they're writers, they're uh, able to submit scripts that they would like to maybe see have happen. And then we have a partnership with Actors Casting Association, ACA, mm -hmm. uh, and they'll cast it for us, and then we go ahead and produce it. So we had Our Father Knows Best uh, mm -hmm. come out of the pilot show, and That's we've great. had more submissions. Yeah. So we really hope that here at FPTV, uh, we can serve as a resource for people who are wanting to flesh out their ideas and don't want to have cost be a hurdle for them in that absolutely. regard. I, I think that that is absolutely a, a, a valid model for, again, how you can connect with an audience. But more than that, maybe have a career. Uh, the idea of proof of concept, short films or, or pilots, um, has something that's worked really well. So for example, Whiplash, a movie that got a lot of attention a couple years ago, started out as a short film that was a proof of concept. Um, the Jeremy Saulnier that I just mentioned also made a short version of, uh, I think, Blue Ruin as a proof of concept that allowed him to get investors involved. So that is absolutely something that still works uh, in terms of showing that you know what you're doing. Now, having said that, you might not know what you're doing, and you need to <laughs> learn right. how to make a film, how to write a script. And so I think you also need to be patient, take your time, do the work, and I think 
resources like this are incredible for being uh, for having the access to to a, you know no pun intended to allow people to sort of learn how to do it in a community of other people trying to learn how to do it. I, I don't see why Northwest Arkansas can't compete with places like Austin in terms of film production and generating talent. Um, I think the next step for us as a region is to have a full-scale film production department at the University of Arkansas. I think that would be a huge help um, because then you'd also have a sort of steady flow of folks learning how to make it and then using resources like this after they graduate or maybe while they're in school. Um, but again, I don't see any reason why this region couldn't be an important sort of nexus for filmmaking. Yep, no, we're hoping to be to be doing that as we go. Um, so you mentioned agents and managers. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between an agent and a manager? Um, <laughs> they both get 10%. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and there's lawyers too, so you have a lawyer. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, and it's evolved over time. I, I know folks who've been in the business longer than I have who don't have managers. They, they don't see the point. Uh, they've always had an agent, and only an agent, and a lawyer. Um, just to be clear, agents get 10, managers get 10, lawyers get 5%. Okay. So 25% off the top of everything you make, uh, you don't get. Um, so basically, the way it works now, uh, the, the conventional wisdom is that a manager is there to manage your career. So they're the ones who are out there thinking ahead uh, in terms of relationships that you might need to build with producers, executives, that kind of thing. They're setting up meetings for you to go and just meet and greet um, important people who might have projects that could come your way. Um, and they're also rolling up their sleeves and working with you on, you know, I, I pitch my manager three or four ideas on here's what I'm thinking about, am I right next? And, and he's quick to say, you know, those three won't work because either that isn't selling right now or three of those just sold, so don't go down that road. Um, so having that kind of feedback with someone who their whole life is keeping their finger on the pulse of what's happening in Hollywood is super important. And you may be thinking, well, I thought that's what agents did. Well, the way it's evolved now, agents for the most part are there to make the deal. Now, for some of their higher end clients, um, I'm sure they are much more involved in that sort of day-to-day -day, uh, activity. But typically speaking, agents have three to four times the number of clients that managers do. They don't have the time to manage the career in the same way. Uh, so the manager is there to sort of position you to produce the material and connect with others who have material to do the work that you need to do. And then the agent's there to come along and make sure you get the most money possible when you have something to sell or you have a deal to make. Um, and then your lawyer is there to read the contracts and uh, make sure you're uh, not being taken advantage of. Um, so, so everyone has a bit of a role. And, and I have found that it's really important to have all three. Um, I think if I were at a higher level, if I you know, were someone like uh, Aaron Sorkin, you know, I, I probably wouldn't need to give away that extra 10%. Um, but for now, I feel like uh, it's really helpful. So my manager uh, is a sort of a small shop manager, and he doesn't have a huge client list. Um, but the writers that he does have are, are pretty important, um, one of which is Graham Moore, who just won the Academy Award a couple years ago for Imitation Game. Um, my agent is at UTA, and that is a giant agency with dozens, if not hundreds, of agents and thousands of clients. And what that means is when I have a script that could go out into the marketplace, that has been shepherded with my manager, my agent can get directors and A-list actors attached to the script so that when it goes out to studios, it's a more appealing package. And a smaller agent, for example, wouldn't necessarily have that power to do that. So I really like having both, having the sort of personal attention of a manager and the power of this like giant agency that can come along when the time is right and uh, really make a difference. Um, but you know, everyone's, everyone's a little different. Um, you know, uh, some some sort of appreciate that approach, and some not so much. Some prefer a smaller agency. Uh, I think if you're interested in television, um, agents are incredibly important uh, because they're the ones that get you jobs in writing room, uh, working on other television shows and that kind of thing. Um, so it just depends on what your goals are. So what's next for you? What are you working on right now? Um, I'm always working on several things right. at once. Um, because you never know what's going to work, and uh, you want to try and keep as many things going as possible, not all your eggs in one basket. So um, I was just out. So I, I live in Fayetteville, which means I do have to travel to Los Angeles quite a bit, because that's really where things happen. I can Skype meetings. I can do telephone meetings. Um, but being, there's nothing beats being in the room with executives if you have a project to pitch or you want to discuss um, 
a project. So uh, we go out to Los Angeles quite a bit. And so I was just there last summer pitching a television show that uh, still has a little bit of life left in it. We'll see. Uh, but it's very competitive uh, business trying to get a, a show bought. And even then, it's a very long process where you write the pilot. And then if they like the pilot, they'll make the pilot. If they like the pilot, then maybe they'll take it to series. And that can take years. So you can't really, again, put all your eggs in that basket. In the meantime, I uh, just finished a big studio spec script, uh, a kind of swing for the fences, $150 million project uh, that I can't really talk much about because only a couple of people have it right now. But that is this close to just going out to studios, so we'll see. We'll see. I'll report back if that, right, if right, that right. goes well. Uh, and I just uh, pitched a new idea to my manager um, of a new feature spec project that I want to start, and he seems to dig it. So I'll probably be sort of starting that process of outlining and beginning writing this fall. So, and in the meantime, I'm also thinking about what new shows can I pitch uh, next summer. Uh, basically, for broadcast television. There's a very specific pitch season that goes from May to October where they buy new ideas. Uh, cable's a little more open. but uh, So I'm thinking about new TV shows that I might go out uh, and pitch um, next summer. So that was what I was looking for. So you have lots of projects yeah. all at once in yeah. different stages of germination, as it were. Yeah. Um, I, I also have a short film I shot last summer. I'm still editing. I'm trying to finish that. Uh, and I'm also in the back of my mind thinking I want to write another feature script that I could shoot myself. Uh, that would be sort of no or low budget that maybe we'll shoot here in Northwest Arkansas and maybe next summer or something like that. Um, nice. It's a little overwhelming to try and keep all those plates spinning, but again, you kind of you kind of have to to make a living at this. Uh, right. You kind of can't just do one thing. You gotta keep things going. So if people want to learn more, um, first of all, you you teach at the U of A. I do. So um, what what class do you teach? So at the university, um, I I went and met with the communication department and said, hey, I'm in town. I, I I think it would be fun to teach. I taught for many years um, in New York, but not film. I taught anthropology. Strange uh, shift in career. But uh, I loved the classroom. I loved teaching. And uh, they were gracious enough to let me teach the film lecture class. So um, that's a big lecture format where I just show my favorite movies, and we talk about cinematography and acting and editing and, and writing. Uh, and I also teach a class. Um, it's sort of a professional development class for anyone who's interested in Hollywood. Um, it's sort of about the business of Hollywood. And we talk about the history of the studio system and sort of where are we now and uh, how does the whole industry work. And I have producers and executives Skype in and talk to the students. And it's really, it's really a, a, a kind of a fun class. Um, but I've also been thinking about maybe um, doing some kind of screenwriting workshop locally um, if folks are interested. I haven't actually gotten it together to do that yet, um, mm -hmm. but I've been thinking about it. that might be interesting. That'd be really exciting. Mm -hmm. So where can people find out more about you? Well, I have a Vimeo page if you want to see some of the short films that I've done, uh, because again, that waiting around for permission for someone to make your stuff can be incredibly frustrating. So one of the things I've tried to do over the last few years is just make things. Even though I already am sort of in the industry, uh, that has not stopped me from wanting to continue to be productive and put stuff out there. So I've got some short films and a, and a documentary that I made that was just here at the Fayetteville Film Fest. Oh, yeah, that is, yeah. Um, so uh, you can check out some of that stuff on my Vimeo page. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being here today and for sharing Thank you. all this information with us. It was my pleasure. It's really wonderful. Yeah. And we want to encourage you to take advantage of the resources at FPTV and also look into uh, taking Russell's classes if you are interested in uh, pursuing this further. So thank you very much for joining us here on the interview on FPTV.